Well, good morning and happy Father's Day to all you dads. I'm glad you guys are here. Woohoo! Dad power never in the house. Here you go. Um, welcome to all of you who are joining us online. I know there's still another wave of COVID going on, and I know some people are out vacating in other places and stuff like that, but joining us here on our Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you who are watching online uh, as well. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tyler Jagan. I'm the lead pastor here at River Run. And today I'm excited that uh, we have a guest speaker. His name is Bill Yergin. Uh, I've known Bill for the last couple of years or so, and he's been a huge blessing in my life. And he's also been one of the most unique people I've gotten to, to meet and get to know as well. Uh, some of you have heard me uh, tell a little bit about who he is, and for those of you who don't know him, uh, he has uh, been a river runner for the last couple of years. He's CEO of a company called Correct Craft. It has multiple boat businesses and other businesses that are synergy to the boat boating world. Uh, he has served uh, two different White House administrations, the Obama administration and the Trump administration. Uh, he has written numerous books uh, for you UCF people. He just uh, recently came off of his term on the board of trustees there. Uh, he's truly unique. I could just go on and on and on. But the reason why I asked Bill to come and speak is that getting to know him over the last couple of years, uh, he, he's a man that I've gotten to know that really does, he just really loves the Lord. And he loves his family, which is great here on Father's Day. And and he loves what he does, and he's really intentional about desiring to live all those things out in his life. And so I would just thought it might be encouraging to all of you uh, people and all of you guys, especially the dads, to hear it from a dad who, who's probably just like you, you know, loves the Lord, loves your family, you have work, love what you do, and how do you do all of those things um, together? So I encourage him and ask him to come and speak, and so I'm so glad that... Uh, that he decided to do that. Uh, Bill lives the life. He's invested in, in his family's life, their business. They've baptized people in their business. They have uh, uh, Bible studies all across the country in their different manufacturing places. Uh, they, they, they just do so many wonderful things to incorporate everything they do to honor God. And so it's with great pleasure to introduce you, uh, Bill Yergin. Thank you. Happy Father's Day. A few weeks ago, Pastor Tyler approached me and he said, Bill, he said, I want to have the best dad I know speak on Father's Day. He said, somebody who just really inspire a crowd. And then he told me that guy wasn't available and, and, and asked if I would be here. So here I am. I know this is church and, and I don't want you to covet, but I'm going to model these glasses here just for a second. These are our correct craft, you know, sunglasses. I want to model them just for a second. And, and I'm a bit of a mind reader, so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, how can I get a pair of glasses like that? So we're in luck. Since it is Father's Day, I thought I'd throw in a couple dad jokes. You know what dad jokes are, right? Dad jokes are the jokes that, you know, the kids laugh at, the moms roll their eyes, their teenagers are embarrassed to think, oh, is my dad really saying that? Well, I'd throw in a couple dad jokes, but just to make it a little more interesting, I do have um, three dad jokes and three pairs of sunglasses. So we're going to give away, if any dad or anybody, you don't have to be a dad, can tell me the punchline before I pull it up on the screen, then uh, you'll get a pair of these cool crack craft sunglasses. You're just thinking, wow, I wish I had a pair of those. So um, we're going we're gonna to start out, uh, we'll start out number one with dad joke number one here. Let's see. Uh, the dad says, I lost my job at the bank. And the son says, why? Why did the dad lose his job at the bank? Well, go ahead. Anybody else? Okay. I couldn't what? <laughs> a woman asked me to check her balance, so I pushed her over. So here's the dad. So here you go. A couple rows back. You can pass him a couple rows back. So, so there's a couple more. Now, I got to tell you, that's, you're not off to a good start here. And... <laughs> The, the first service, they got one out of the three right. Now, you've got two more chances. You're going to have to, you got to at least do as good as the, the first service. The summer of 1998 was the most challenging and difficult time of my life. A man who'd been the best person that I'd ever known was dying. My dad at 49 had gotten Parkinson's disease. He was now 65. He'd struggled with it for over 15 years. And it just had, had been very, very difficult on our family and my mom in particular, but all of us. 
dad was in hospice the last three weeks of his life, and my aunt, my mom, my brother, and I spent three weeks basically uh, there with him in his hospice room. Uh, several nights, I slept on the floor, on the bed. I slept on the floor right next to his bed in the hospice room. Dad passed away on July 5th, 1998, and it was incredibly, incredibly difficult. But I knew when my dad passed away that I'd had the best father ever. I'd had a father that was totally engaged in my life, that was 100% involved in everything that I could be involved in, was always there and willing to help. A dad that was humble, a dad that was always present, and a dad that had a big impact on my life. And I knew in July of 1998 when my dad passed away that if I could be half the dad that my dad was, I would be a good dad. My father journey, my journey as a father started a few years before dad passed away. Uh, when my daughter, Aman my daughter, excuse me, Aaron was born. I do know what order they were born. <laughs> my daughter Aaron was born, and 15 months later, Amanda was born. And anytime in, I'm insecure about anything, like I was about being a father, I read. I'm a reader. So between the time Aaron was born until the time that they were teenagers, I read probably 100 books on how to be a good dad and how to be a good parent. As you can see, they started off a little rough, uh, a little outlawish, but actually... Uh, they grew up and to be two wonderful young women of, which, of whom I am very, very proud today. When we look through the Bible, there's lots of dads. There's hundreds of dads. Um, not all so good. But there's one dad that we don't really know a lot about because the Bible doesn't talk about it, much about him. And the Bible doesn't record anything that he said, but obviously he was very impactful. And that was Jesus, the earthly father of, uh, excuse me, that was Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. Now we know, of course, Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father, but uh, he was his earthly father and was given the responsibility for raising Jesus. Uh, we do know a few things about him. We're going to look at some verses that normally we just hear at Christmas. But if you'll bear with me, I'm not going to read the verses because there's 17 of them for sake of time. But you all know the story. Um, it's told in First Matthew. You know, Mary and Joseph were engaged. And engagement then was a little more formal than it is now. You know, basically the families would get together, the couples would get together and they would, the families would agree the couple was right for each other and they would become engaged. Typically at this point, some type of dowry would change hands, but then there was a waiting period and the husband-to-be would go off and he would go off to build a home and to prepare a place for his new wife and his family to come. And, and Joseph, this, we were in this waiting period. So Joseph had, was building a place, getting ready for his marriage and, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, conceived a baby inside of Mary. Mary became pregnant. Now, Mary had to tell Joseph this. Mary had to tell Joseph she was pregnant. I can't imagine the disorientation, the, just how Mary felt, how Joseph felt when all this was happening. But Mary had to tell Joseph, so she went to Joseph and told him. Now, Joseph had a lot of uh, alternatives. Uh, by some accounts, during this time, he could have had her stoned, could have had her put to death. This is a contract. They were engaged to be married. He knew it wasn't his baby. He could have stoned her. He could have had her put to death. He could have certainly ridiculed her, had her humiliated, uh, set her up for life. A single mom uh, with a baby at this point was just, it was just beyond what we can imagine how difficult it would be with Mary. Joseph decided he wasn't going to do that. He was just going to end this quietly. He wasn't going to try to hurt Mary. He was just going to end this quietly and get on with his life. Well, when he decided that, but before he announced it, he had a dream. And he had a dream, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and, and told him the story, told him what was happening here. Uh, Joseph woke up from the dream, and I can imagine just how, again, disoriented he was. You know, this was before, uh, you know, pepperoni pizza with anchovies. So, you know, this wasn't a pizza dream. Um, this was a, you know, it was a dream, Joseph. And he woke up, and he's, you know, he's, he's probably a little disoriented what I'm going to do. But he made a decision that he was going to uh, do right by Mary. He was going to uh, follow what the angel of the Lord told him to do. And he took Mary, um, in this verse we read, that you know, he took Mary as his wife, and they had Jesus. Joseph had to be an exceptional guy. Can you imagine the ridicule and the humiliation of the people in Nazareth? I've had the opportunity to visit Nazareth. It's a small little town on top of the mountains. I've sort of, when I was there, tried to picture what it would be like in Jesus' time. And just what people would say, Joseph, you're marrying her. You know it's not your baby. You're marrying all, everything. And trying to explain to people, oh, yes, what's well, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And people are just like rolling their eyes. Yeah, okay, we'll go with that one. This has never happened before, right? So Joseph had to be an exceptional guy, just a really, really exceptional guy. And so I'd like us to look at these two super dads today. And, and if we can for a minute, just imagine, what if we can take lessons from these super dads? We can say, okay, are there some lessons? 
three things we can learn from these guys and we can pull them out and we can apply them to us today. Something that would be transformative to us today. And by the way, moms, and if you don't have kids, I'm framing this with it to dads because this is Father's Day, but everything I'm going to say today applies to all of us. But just imagine, there's three things. We could, we could pull three things from their lives. We could compare it to what the Bible teaches us, and we could take things that we could walk out of the door today and be transformed, be totally different people. Well, I think we can do that. So before we do that, though, dad joke number two. All right, get your dad joke A game on, guys. Okay, this one's probably not as hard as the first one, but the third one's definitely the easiest. So the, sec- the first group didn't get this one either, but... Why did the man fall down the well? Yes, sir. He slipped. Okay, that's one way. Wow. Okay, really good. All right. Well, you guys are one ahead so far because he couldn't see that well. So thank you, Pastor Tyler. I will deliver it right back to him. Very good. All right, you're one up. You got a chance to top the, and the third one's the easy one. So, um, but before we go that, before we do that, let's look at three things that we can learn from these super dads and concepts that are, are totally consistent with the Bible. The first thing is that super dads have humility. Super dads are humble. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, a verse that you're all familiar with, it says, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. How many of us want destruction to come down on our families? Anybody? How many of us want destruction to come down on our careers, our lives, ministries we might be involved in? Anybody? Of course, nobody wants that, right? So we don't want destruction. The Bible tells us really clearly how to avoid that. It says pride comes before destruction. But it's something that's incredibly difficult and challenging. You know, I I don't think God ranks sin. I think to, to God, sin is sin. But if God did rank sin, he probably wouldn't rank it like we would. You know, if we rank sin, we rank, you know, murder, rape, lying, stealing, on and on. You know, sort of big, big sins. I think if God ranked sin, he would probably put number one, the thing that probably most of us, I know I do, struggle with the most. And that's pride. And, and, and being prideful. But the Bible also tells us that though we struggle with it, it leads to destruction. There's a, uh, our super dads, you know, my dad, I never remember one time one time do I ever remember my dad um, calling attention to himself, trying to get credit for something that he did or didn't do, self-promoting. My dad was a humble guy. Joseph had to be a humble guy. Listen, you can't, you've got to be a humble guy to do what Joseph did and take in Mary and take in this baby that you knew was not yours because you were going to get a lot of ridicule, a lot of joking, a lot of people looking at you a little strange Joseph had to be a humble guy. So our super dads are, were, are, were humble guys. There's a really good book. Uh, it's called uh, Derailed. It's written by a guy named Tim Irwin. And Tim Irwin looks at all these leaders that are what you call like rock star leaders, either CEOs or nonprofit leaders or government leaders. He looks at these leaders and he identifies five things that, that end up in what he calls catastrophic failures of leadership. So these are all leaders that we all, can, we all would look up to and think, wow, they're doing such a great job. But there's five things that lead to catastrophic failures. But there's really one thing when I read the book. I left thinking there's one thing that leads to us to get derailed. And that's pride. If we're the head of our house, if we're the head of a business, we're head of a department, any kind of role that we're in, when we start getting full of ourselves, destruction's around the corner. And I've seen this over and over and over again, you know, in the business world, ministry world. You know, pride's a very, very dangerous thing. And uh, pride is something that's, but it's also something that's really challenging to fight. So how do we fight it? How do we uh, avoid it? Uh, There's another great book. This is a Christian psychologist, a guy named Henry Cloud wrote this. I've had an opportunity to meet Henry Cloud. He's a great guy. He's actually a water skier. He's a big fan of our company and um, grew up behind our boats. He's written, I think, 30 books or so, written a lot of books. And in one of his books is called The Power of Other. And he said that, he says in the book that, you know, we need other people in our lives to have an impact for us. We need other people in our lives. And he at, tells a story, I don't think it's in the book, but I've heard him tell the story about um, uh, these monkeys. And he put these monkeys in a cage. He didn't, but there's a research study. He put these monkeys in a cage and they made all kinds of noise, banging and loud music and all kinds of noise. And at the end of it, they stopped the noise. They took the monkeys and they took blood samples from the monkeys. And their cortisol levels, their stress levels were super high. And so they repeated the, the test again at a later time. But this time they put a second monkey 
in the cage. And when they did it and they took the blood test, the cortisol, le cortisol levels were about half. Having somebody else there with them, somebody else beside them, made their life much better, made it easier. For us guys, sometimes when we're dealing with pride, it's really hard to do it by yourself. You've got to have somebody to hold you accountable. And you know, hopefully your wife does that, your kids do that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate because I think my wife, my kids, I've got people at work that will speak up when I'm get, sort of getting off the rails. Uh, but you need somebody in your life that would do that. You know, it's hard for us for a couple of reasons. One is, for many of us, it's hard to be transparent. Really hard to be transparent. Some of us got a different problem. For me, um, I don't think I have any trouble being transparent, but I'm a high, really high extrovert. If you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs assessment, I'm a 30 of a 30 on the extrovert scale. And what that means is that I've got friends a mile wide, you know, lots and lots of friends, but an inch deep. And so for us to have somebody to really hold us accountable, we need to have those deep relationships in our life and somebody that will help us do that because pride's very destructive and it's very hard to fight on ourselves, by ourselves. The second attribute of a super dad is presence and being present. Uh, Jesus said in, during the Sermon on the Mount, it covers about three chapters in the book of Matthews, but this is an excerpt from it. He says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Jesus is saying, be present today. Be present today. You know, for some of us, that's not so easy. For me, it's not easy. Uh, in the business world, I'm what's called a strategic leader. What that means is I'm not thinking much about today. I'm thinking about next week, next year, five years from now, ten years from now. But to be present, we've got to be in the moment now, in the moment now and focusing on today. When I think of our super dads, my dad was present. And he was present at everything. He was, you know, he was at our baseball, basketball, football games for both me and my brother. Not only our games, he was at our practices and often he was the coach of the team. Every school event, dad was at the school event. Dad was president of our lives. Dad's passed away, as I said earlier. But there's about a 100% chance that if he was alive today, he'd be here with us this morning. Dad was just present. He probably would have been the first service and the second service. Dad was present. That was just the kind of dad that he was. Joseph had to be present. You know, Joseph, as you know, uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Joseph took Jesus to Egypt to be with, Egypt, to be with Jesus in Egypt to keep him, to protect him from Herod, who was trying to kill him at the time. Uh, Jesus grew up in a family that likely Joseph would have been with Jesus every day, teaching him and training him and teaching him skills as he grew up. Joseph was a present, um, present dad. This is my uh, grandbaby, Rosemary. Now, in the first service, my wife was sitting down here. And when I showed this slide, she started beaming. In this service, my daughter, who's Rosemary's mother, is down here, and I see her beaming. So we're very proud of Rosemary, as you can imagine. And... Uh, I've learned a real lesson with Rosemary, and it's really helped me understand the idea of presence. See, when my kids were young and my kids were babies, there was a lot going on. You know, we had bills to pay. I'd be to work. Do we have clean diapers? Do we have enough food? You know, what's getting, what this needs to be done, that needs to be done. Well, with Rosemary, I can go over to their house. Thankfully, they don't live very far from us. And my daughter, Erin, she'll feed Rosemary. She'll give her a clean diaper and hands her to me. And I can sit there and I can just be present with Rosemary. It's an amazing, it's an amazing feeling to be present with her. And I love that. I can just look in her eyes and I can just hold her and nothing else matters at that moment. I'm not worried about whether there's enough diapers in the, I'm not worried about whether she's got enough food. I'm not, I mean, I care about her and I would be worried if I thought there was a reason to be. But that's, that's not my worry. I can just be present with her. And I think as dads, we've got to resist the temptation not to get caught up in all the sort of noise, all the other stuff and not miss opportunities to really be present. Um, be present with our, our kids. You know, it's, uh, we have a big company. We've got, uh, little, we've got over 2,000 employees. We have uh, about 15 locations spread across the United States. We have distributors in 70 uh, countries. So CEO, I have to be a delegator. I, there's no way I can be involved in all that. It's impossible. Um, and thankfully for me, it sort of comes naturally because I can't do anything by itself really good, but I can delegate. So that's helpful. But, um, you know, as dads and parents, moms, grandparents, you know, just certain things we don't want to delegate. You know, my kids, when they were growing up, they were in Sunday school on Sunday morning, and they were in church, and they were in Awanas on Wednesday night, and they went to Christian school, and they were homeschooled, and when they were homeschooled, uh, they had a Christian curriculum. So I created a lot of structure around making sure that my kids had a strong Christian influence. 
And listen, I, I don't, they can speak for themselves, but I think I was a good dad. I prayed with my kids at night, but I wish I'd had a little more personal involvement in the spiritual formation side. There's just some things you don't delegate. And as I look back, I wish I'd been a little more involved in that. Lots of opportunities. And again, this was important in our family. But, you know, there's just some things as dads, as grandparents, we just don't delegate. You know, we make sure, yeah, they're in a great system. Yeah, we've got a great church here. And we've got a great kids program, youth program. There's some things, you know, we've just they've got to take on responsibility uh, for ourselves. Sometimes we don't feel like being present. You know, we have a saying at our company that started several years ago. Um, one of our company presidents out in California, um, really good guy. He was having a lot of really tough time. One of our other company presidents um, used to tell him, said, Paul, when you don't feel like showing up, just show up. When you don't feel like being present, just be present. In Second Chronicles chapter 15, uh, the prophet Azariah was talking to King Asa and, and others. And he's talking about how Israel is going through rough times. It goes through good times and goes through rough times. But he says, as for you, be strong and courageous for your work will be rewarded. Basically we, what he was saying, if I can sort of the Jurgen translation, he's saying times are tough. I know there's other things you can focus on, but just show up. Just be present. Just be strong and courageous, even when you don't feel like being strong and courageous. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Bethany Hamilton and her husband. Some of you, have, many of you probably have heard of Bethany. Uh, she was a, um, she is a surfer. She was 13 years old and she was in Hawaii and she already had big contracts. People thought she was gonna be the next world champion a really highly regarded surfer. She's 13 years old. She's waiting for a wave to come in. A shark comes up, bites off her arm. She's a big chunk out of her surfboard. And really, really, um, you know, sad story. And Bethany, uh, I had a chance to talk to her husband for a bit, and then she spoke to the group that I was with. And she said, um, why focus on what you don't have? Focus on what you do. And, you know, sometimes being present means not focusing on what we want. You know, a lot of times we're not present because we're, we're thinking about something else that we want. And we, we, we put it within the cloak of, this is going to be good for my family. I need to focus on Listen, I, I was, uh, um, I've traveled almost my whole career for 30 years. And in fact, wrote a book on education of a traveler. Um, and so, I, so we had a lot of frequent, I had a lot, always had a lot of frequent flyer miles. So our family was able to take some just amazing vacations over the years. But we'd be at some location that was a wonderful location in Europe or Asia or the Caribbean. And we'd be on our vacation and I'd be thinking, okay, what are we gonna do next year, right? Because I cared, I wanted to give my family another great experience. But the super dads, they're present in the moment. Really this came back to me when my oldest daughter, Erin, got married. I had somebody tell, I was talking to him about, you know, Erin getting married. And, and this person said to me, they said, Bill, they had been through it actually a few months before me. This was a guy. And he said, just be present. He said, don't think about what's happening. Don't think you're losing your daughter or don't think, you know, about, you know, she's getting married. This is the end of an era for your family. Just be present. And I think that's a great advice. I know my dad was present and uh, I think that's great advice for dad. So number three, before we get into number three, come on guys, I'm really rooting for you. Because you, you'll be able forever you'll be able to say the first service people that you won if you get this one. All right, so here we go. What do you call it when a snowman throws a tantrum? What? Meltdown. Meltdown. All right, who said that? All right. Two for three. Good job, guys. Good job. Yeah, give yourselves a hand. So let's talk about item three. So super dads, super moms, super grandparents are humble. They, they're present. And the third thing is they have an impact. The Bible says in Psalm 37.3, this is a psalm that David was writing, and he's comparing the righteous to the wicked. And, and, and David says, trust in the Lord and do good. Okay, that's what he's saying, trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely and prosper. So what David's saying, if I could simplify it again, not that I can say anything better than David said it or the Holy Spirit inspired, but if I can, if I can, if I can paraphrase it, basically have an impact, then you'll get the rewards that you want. Sometimes we get that mixed up. You know, we start thinking, well, you know, I want to chase the rewards 
and, and I have an opportunity to um, coach business leaders, and I've coached many over the years, business organizational leaders, nonprofits, ministry leaders, and I always tell them, don't chase the rewards. Don't chase what you want. Don't chase the new title, the bigger pay, the higher bonus, the recognition, the praise. Don't chase that stuff. Because when you chase that stuff, you're less likely to get it. Focus on having an impact where you are. Th then the other stuff takes care of itself. But we need to focus. Super dads, they're not focused on how we're going to get the next vacation, how we're going to get a bigger house for my family, how we're going to have a nicer car. They're focused on having an impact in the moment. My dad was like that. You know, I mentioned, you know, he was present. Well, you know, my dad was never a career guy. He worked for 35 years at Proud Whitney, uh, made a good living. We were fine. We, ne we never had much money, but we certainly were, were comfortable and fine, had plenty of food to eat, had a house to live in. But dad wasn't career oriented because he wanted to have an impact on his family. He wanted to be home at 4.30 every day because he was going to the ball field with his boys. He was going to the school event. He wanted to have an impact. You know, the rewards are fine. You know, I look back today, and you know what? If my dad hadn't been at those ball games and we lived in a little nicer house, I'd, I, I, would, I couldn't care less about the house. You know, I was glad that he was there and he was focused on having an impact on my life. So super, Joseph, clearly, if Joseph was focused on the rewards, whatever his rewards may have been, you don't take on, you know, a mom who's a baby that's not your biological child if you're focused on, I mean, this is, child was a burden, certainly at first anyway, right? But Joseph was a super dad. He wasn't focused on um, rewards. He was focused on uh, having an impact. But it's so easy because we get trapped. We get chasing stuff and we get trapped. We're trying to find happiness for us and our family. But you know, I, I love reading about psychology. Every study that I've ever read, every single one about happiness says you don't get happiness by chasing happiness. You get happiness by having an impact trying to help other people, trying to have, that, that's, that's how you get, listen, I, I've been in the, um, I, I, most of my career I've worked with rich people. And during that time, especially when I was down in West Palm, I worked in um, a business, we dealt with yachts. And we had billionaires and just super wealthy people in our, that would come in. And they'd come in with their yachts and their crew and all their staff and all. And I can tell you for a fact, because I've seen it, a lot of times, the people that have what we're chasing, are, they, they have it already, they're incredibly happy, unhappy. There's zero correlation, zero correlation in my experience between having stuff, or the stuff that we often chase, and happiness. In fact, sometimes there's a negative correlation. The more the stuff we have, the less unhappy. But we get on this treadmill. In uh, psychology, they call it the hedonic treadmill. And what it means is that we get on this treadmill and we're chasing stuff. And so we're just chasing stuff and we're chasing stuff and then we get a little bit and we get a little taste of it. The treadmill just speeds up a little bit and then we get a little bit more and just speeds up and you can't get to the end. In other words, you can't get happy that way because no matter what you get or no matter what little taste you get of whatever it is, reward you're looking for, whatever it is you want, you just want a little more. And this is a, this is a, this is, I think it's consistent with Christian teaching, but it's a secular um, psych, psychology concept is that you can't get there. You can't get there no matter how hard you try. So dads, moms, grandparents, we find happiness, our kids find happiness, our families find happiness by focus on having, having an impact. Sometimes having an impact, in fact, not sometimes, all the time having an impact means making sure our actions and our words align because you know what? Our families and our kids are gonna believe what we do way more than they believe what we say. We had a situation a little over 10 years ago, probably close to 15 years ago. Our family moved up here uh, to Chiliota. We live across the street on Lake Pickett. And um, our, we want, it was the 4th of July. My brother brought his four kids up from South Florida. And we wanted to shoot some fireworks off by the lake. So we get all six kids in the car. And we go. We go up to one of these stands. You know, they're starting to pop up already. You know, these tents with all the fireworks. Um, they sell the fireworks. And so I told the kids, the six of them, I said, go in and pick anything you want. Just pick something out. Everybody gets to pick something. Bring it back up. Uncle Bill will buy it, and we'll go shoot off, have some fun in the lake. So the kid, you know how it is. They're coming up, should I get this, Uncle Bill? Should I get this? Or, 
you know, what's, what's, look at this. And all, they're all super excited. And frankly, I was just as excited as they were. And so we go and we, we get it up to the cash register and the guy's ringing it up. And there's a stack of papers. There's probably 30, 40 papers there. And they've, each piece of paper's got maybe 30, 40 signatures on it. So lots and lots of name sign. And the man's ringing it up and he says to me, he says, oh, before I can sell you this, I need you to sign this paper. Like, sign this paper? What do you mean sign this paper? And he said, well, he said, you've got a sign that you're going to use this for agricultural use. And I said, well, it's the 4th of July. I'm not going to use it for agricultural use. We're going to set them off in the backyard. That's what people do on the 4th of July. He sort of rolls his eyes at me and says, hey, buddy, it's your choice. If you want the firework, sign the paper. And I thought of those six kids there, and I don't know if any of them even remember this, but I thought of those six kids there, and I thought, you know what? Listen, I want the fireworks as bad as they did, maybe more. And I thought, you know what? If I sign this, I'm gonna, my credibility is out the window for them. I've got to make sure my actions are consistent with my words. Listen, I haven't always done that well in every situation. In fact, I tell the people at our company in our Bible studies, they say, don't look at me, don't follow me. Because if you follow me, if you look at me close enough, I'll let you down because I'm human. I don't want to let you down, but I'll definitely let you down because I'm human. So if we want to have an impact, we've got to make sure our actions and our words align. So we end up with three things. Super dads, super mom, super grandparents. We've got three things. We've got humility, we're present, and then we're impact. So how do you do that? It seems like it'd be easy, doesn't it? Those three things seems like it's easy, but it's not, it's not easy to be humble because pride is so difficult to overcome. It's not easy to be present because there's so much to do and so many things to think about. And it's not easy to focus on impact over rewards because we want stuff. We want rewards. So how do you do that? You got to love big. You got to love really big. You got to love your families big. You got to love your grandkids big. You got to love everybody around you big. You know, when I, I, I um, I'm not a theologian, as is probably pretty obvious to you by now, but um, I am a reader. So I've read the Bible cover to cover many times. And when I look at the Old Testament, I think of choices and consequences. You know, Moses said in Deuteronomy, um, you know, make good choices, you get good results, make bad choices, there's bad consequences. And that carried its way through the whole Old Testament. But when we get in the New Testament, we get a new, uh, new covenant, new message. And the message is love and loving big. The biggest indication of that love is that Jesus would die for us. He'd go to the cross for our sins and atone for us. But Jesus also told us to love and um, told us to love. And, and he said, actually, when the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus, you all remember the story. Um, the Pharisees didn't like Jesus very much. He was, you th they were the religious rulers. You'd think they would have embraced him. But he was very threatening to them and their position. And so the Pharisees said they're going to trick Jesus. And so they, they come to Jesus. And, and at that time, they had the Old Testament law. But on top of the Old Testament law, the Pharisees had piled all kinds of rules and regulations on top of the Old Testament law. So the Pharisees went to Jesus and said, what's most important? Oh, I got all this stuff. Tell us what's most important. Because they knew no matter what he said, they'd be able to trick him up somehow. And Jesus said this. He said, love God and love others. I am so glad that the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus up that day. And I'm so glad that that's recorded in the New Testament. Because you know what? It doesn't take a lot of theologians. It doesn't take a lot of, you know, smart people to figure out. These are the words of Jesus. Love God, love others. You know, so we say, okay, well, loving others, I can do that. I know how to do that. I can feed the sick. I can take care of my family when they need me. But how do I love God? How do I love God? Is it just a feeling that I've got towards God? Well, Jesus thankfully made this clear for us too. Right before he was crucified, he's speaking to his um, disciples. And he's talking about the final judgment. And he says to them, he said, in the final judgment, I'll reward people who fed me when I was hungry and clothed me when I was naked and gave me, um, gave me a place to stay when I needed a place to stay and visited me in prison. And they're confused because they're like, we didn't do any of that stuff. What are you talking about? And Jesus said, when you do it for the least of these, you do it for me. And so how do we love God? We love God by loving others, right? That's how we love God. We show our love for God by loving others. So as if we needed any more clarification, after Jesus is crucified, he's resurrected, he's talking to Peter. And he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, of course I love you, Lord. And he said, then feed my sheep. 
He says, he asked Peter a couple more times. Fr frankly, Peter's getting a little irritated. He's like, I've said it. I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. He's telling Peter, take care of my people. Love on my people. I'm going back to heaven. Love on my people. Paul, again, in the epistles, not that it needs to be emphasized anymore, but again, throughout the epistles, Paul talks about, you know, the importance of love. So if we're going to do these things, if we're going to be humble, if we're going to be present, if we're going to have an impact, it's going to take a big love. It's going to take a big love for our families, not just our families, the people around us and all those around us. You say, well, you know, all these things you talk about this morning, you know, that's all, you know, that's all fine, but, you know, that's not how I've been. I haven't lived my life that way. You know, I haven't been humble. I haven't been present like I should. I've been more focused on rewards and impact. You're not a prisoner to your past. You're not, you know, the, the, around the first of the year, every year I teach a Bible study to our company. It's very, first Bible study year is almost always the same one or very similar. And I talk about fresh starts. And I'll give examples. You know, Moses was a murderer. Moses was a murderer. And he was used in a mighty way by God to help the people get out of Egypt. Rahab was a prostitute. She helped the Israel, Israelites when they're coming into the promised land. And also was even in the lineage of Jesus. David was an adulterer and a murderer. The Bible records in the New Testament that he followed God's plan for his life. Saul, Paul, okay, this is a guy who's going into houses and he's pulling people out of houses to have them stoned if they're Christians. Or he's pulling people out of houses to have them imprisoned if they're Christians. You know, none of us have done anything like that. And even Paul, as bad as that, how do you get much worse than that, right? You're killing Christians. Even Paul was used in a mighty way, and, and by many accounts, probably the second most influential person after Jesus, the spread of, spread of Christianity. So you're not a prisoner. You're not a prisoner of, of whatever your, your past has been. You know, my dad, I mentioned, passed away July 5th, 1998. And I told you a little bit about that. It was probably about four years before I had an opportunity to get back to uh, Oxford, North Carolina, where he's buried. Um, we lived in here, we live in Florida, but dad was uh, buried where his family was from in Oxford, North Carolina. And just for a number of circumstances, I didn't have an opportunity to get back. And I was on a business trip and I uh, was in Raleigh and I drove up to Oxford, it's about 30, 40 minutes north of Raleigh. And I drove up to Oxford and I visited dad's grave. And it was a very emotional time. I'm just standing there crying. I'm just crying and I just miss my dad so much. And I'm standing there, and I, I know he's not there, but you know his body is. Six, his body's six feet from him. I know he's in heaven. And I actually felt disloyal leaving him. Get, I, couldn't, I had a hard time getting back. I had a plane to catch. I had a hard time getting back in the car because I didn't want to leave him there. I felt, I felt like I was being disloyal doing that. But you know, another thing is I stood there. I knew I was incredibly blessed by an amazing dad that was humble, that was present, and that was focused on having an impact. And someday, someday all of us, every one of us, are going to have our kids or our grandkids or other people we know, they're going to stand either at a grave or they're going to stand in a funeral home, and they're going to think back on our lives, and they're going to think back, what kind of impact did we make on them? How, what kind of people were we? And I am so thankful, so thankful that I can look back and I had a dad that was humble, that was present, and that had an impact and was focused on having an impact. So we get to make that decision now how everybody's going to look back on us. You know, we're still alive. We can still impact that. My dad can't impact that. He's in heaven anymore. So, but we can still impact that. So I just encourage you, you know, focus on being humble. Focus on uh, being present and focus on having an impact. I'm going to wrap up in prayer here in just a second. I'll hang out for a few minutes after we're done. If, um, if anybody would like, I'm not a pastor, but I'm happy to pray for you. If any of this is um, impactful for you, happy to pray with you. And we're going to sing a song about victory here in a minute and getting victory. We can have victory over our past. If we, if we haven't done these things, we can change today. We can be different today. So let's uh, close in prayer, and then I'll be done. Lord, thank you so much that we can be here today. Lord, I just pray that we'll be people of humility, that we'll be present, and that we'll be focused on an impact. 
not just for ourselves or our kids, our grandkids or those around us, Lord, but for you and to glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.